Okay, everyone. My guess is a few people will pop in afterwards, which is fine because I don't have very many slides and then we'll just get to work. Um, so I'm going to start with asking you guys why you want to learn R. There's only a few of us here. So if you guys want to do it verbally, that's fine. If you want to be anonymous, um, it is possible to click into this and, and do it there, or you could throw it in the chat. So why do we want to learn, learn R out of curiosity before we start? Social network analysis, independence, very nice. <laughs> R in the past and a refresher and grad school. Oh, that's perfect. Okay, so I will tell you guys that um, I didn't know R when I started uh, in grad school and I was a molecular biologist and there was some data I wanted to analyze. So I learned R just for analyzing data, which I think is what a lot of people wanna do. Um, I think there are lots of great workshops out there and I think that you should be using them. But the main reason I'm teaching this one today is the problem that I see with the workshops is that when you hit an error, you don't know what to do. <laughs> and not knowing what the error means is actually the, the hardest part of learning any of these coding things. Um, so I'm going to let you guys uh, drive and I will just walk you through what we're doing and everybody will be able to do it um, all together so that we can troubleshoot at the same time. So the goal today is really showing you guys what an error looks like in R and how to get past an error in R um, so that you can use any resource you want to learn R from here out. Okay, so um, I'm going to have you guys all do the same thing as me which is I will share screen on Firefox or your favorite web browser. I don't care what you use. My favorite is Firefox. It does not matter. Um, and what you're gonna Google is RStudio and cloud. So RStudio is a program that wraps around R so that you can run R and not have to be working on command line. It's a really nice interface. Some of you, if you went to install RStudio on your computer, it would be super quick and easy. And some of you, it would take forever and tons of troubleshooting. And I don't want to do that. So today we're just gonna use RStudio on the cloud um, because they let you use it for free. Uh, so I'm going to go into this R studio and actually I'm going to log out. I'm going to log in with an account I've never used for this before, just so that, um, it does not see me as having been here before. So I'm going to sign up for an account. Clearly that's what I used last time, but I'll use my other email. So you guys see what it looks like. And you guys can sign up as well so that you have an account. If you happen to have R on your own computer, R Studio, you don't have to do it through the, uh, the uh, Arc Studio Cloud. But if you don't, you can do it through this because we don't want to have to fight with installs today. So uh, you will sign up. Um, it will ask you which one of these three things you want to do. And you want to do the cloud setting, Posit Cloud. Maybe post, I'm not sure how that's pronounced. And then you will come here. Um, and when you get into here, it may require you to use a password to get in. Oh, it's still logging me under the other one. Let's do it with Google. That'll do. Oh, okay. So it doesn't want me to do that. Well, you guys can sign up and it should just let you. And I'll log in with my other email. And once we've got a couple of people on here, we will keep going again. 
When you come into this screen, if you are using the cloud, you just want to click new project. And once um, I'm going to have you guys, since you guys have your little um, emojis at the bottom, you should be able to use the zoom to tell me um, thumbs up if this is working with either thumbs up, a chat, something like that, because I want to see how many people have made it on. Still waiting for an email verification. Okay, we'll wait just a minute. While we're waiting, I am going to click on new project. And like I said, if you already have our studio on your computer, you don't need to do this. It's just fine to do what we're going to do today on your computer, but not everybody already has our studio. <laughs> Okay, so if you are not yet on, can you tell me that you're not yet on in the chat? Just so we can see how many people are still trying to get on. It just worked, okay. By the way, if anybody's wondering why we're doing this so late on a Saturday night, um, this was brought up in, I'm in a group on Facebook called the PhD Mamas. Um, and we talked about wanting to learn R, but how it's hard with small children. So we decided the easiest way to do it would be to put the kids to bed and then learn R. <laughs> Which is why it's at such an odd time. Okay, so I'm going to assume most people are on at this point. And if you are on, you should be able to come up to this corner panel and click this little plus green sign here and you'll have lots and lots of options but the only one we're going to use today is this very top one called your R script and once you have clicked on R scripts you really have four sections in our studio so this part is the script where you're going to write something down and then run it you could also run, this is the live console, so you could do things live here. And then you have these other two sections which are really useful because they tell you what's in the same directory as where you currently are, and then what do you have saved in your environment. So if you haven't worked with a coding language before, totally fine. If I say anything confusing, slow me down. Um, when you're dealing with a coding language, the reason coding is so useful is that you can set variables. And so we're going to set a variable and we're going to make the easiest variable we know. We're going to set A equal to, and then somebody give me a number. Five. Five. A equal to five. Okay. And then we're going to run it with this little run button. Can you give me a thumbs up if you were able to run A equals five, the easiest command? Uh, I'm not able to find it. Can I share my screen and show what Please problem do. I'm that's, having? That's what exactly, this is what this is for because the hard part is this first step. If it's not working, you don't know what to do and the books will never teach you that. Exactly. <laughs> so go ahead and share screen. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, so. Okay, so click that new project button right up in the uh, right-hand corner. 
all the way in the other corner. Yep. Uh, new project. It's a little bit further down. There you go. New okay. RStudio project. Perfect. So if you have RStudio installed on your computer, which you can do later, and that's totally fine, um, it will look exactly like this. This is just a version that's in the cloud so that we don't have to worry about. Some computers have a hard time getting R installed and some don't. So the next thing okay. you're going to, want to do is go click on that little green plus sign right under file. And what that does is to open a new R script. So click on R script. So now you have the four areas. You've got the top corner where your script is and you run things. Your bottom where it actually shows up on the left. On the right hand side is where it shows you what you've done so far. So go ahead and type A equals five. And then there's a run button right above that. Um, yep, there you go, run it. So in the bottom, Thanks. did you see what happened? And I'll just let you continue to do it because I actually think it's better if someone else is typing. So did you see what happened there? A couple of things. One, in the console, it showed you what happened. You set A equal to five. Up in the right-hand corner, you'll see A and five because now if you type A, it will tell you that A is five. So let's try it down in the console area is where you can ask it questions. So go down to that console in the left hand bottom and just type A and see what happens. And then hit enter. There you mm -hmm. go. And so what it told you is A is equal to five. Now let's do something. I'm gonna purposefully make it error a lot in class because if you hit an error, you're not gonna know how to do it unless you've seen it. So type B right now and then hit enter. So what do you think that error is telling you? We haven't defined B. That's right, we have not yet defined B. And so if you ever see that and you think you've defined something, the most likely solution is that you have a slightly different spelling or capitalization, which is my favorite part about this um, upper corner that's got environment because then you can scroll through and go, okay, what did I spell that? Did I use a capital letter? I don't remember. Um, and so the environment's really useful for double checking that you named it what you think you named it, if that makes sense. Okay. So it's like a code book. That's right, exactly. It's like a, what, it's like a notebook. Like when you're taking notes in lab, you put them over to the side. It's like, this is what you did. Okay, so uh, the next thing we're gonna do is now let's set B since we didn't have B set. Somebody want to take driving? Like I said, I think it's better if someone else does it because it slows me down. Who's I can do it. Show your screen, exactly. Can you see mine? Hold on. I Let do, me... but I see the cheat sheet rather than the- um, Okay, hold on. Our studio. Uh, hold on. I think it's, oops, hold on. I think it is, one second, let me pull it out. I have many tabs open. Yep, me too, <laughs> always. Yeah. So this, it's that. There you go. Oh, okay, found it. I was looking for R Studio, but it's called Posit. Yeah, so they renamed them themselves, yeah. which I think is hilarious because nobody's ever going to remember Posit. They're always going to remember R Studio. It's been named that for 30 years. Maybe not quite that long, but close. Okay, perfect. So now, okay. since B was not set, it errored. So then let's set B to something. It's up to you. What do you want to set B to? Okay, I'm going to do B equals 8. There you go. Sounds good. Now, if you go ahead and type it, because what you'll see is you didn't run it yet. Right. You still won't know what it is. Mm, you have okay, to so make sure you run it, and then it will know what B is. Okay, so now we put B and it should be yep. eight. Exactly. So now that you've got two variables, those variables can be used just like those two numbers. You can do any <laughs> equation you want to in the bottom console. So go ahead and do any equation you want with A and B. A plus B, A minus okay. B, I don't care. <laughs> Let's do A plus B, okay. It will give you the answer. Okay, 
So now we're going to talk about the difference between what's going on in the console and what's going on in the script up above, okay? When you just run A plus B, it does the calculation and it gives it to you in something it calls standard out, which means I'm just going to show it to you, but it has not recorded that value in any way, okay? So let's say we want it to have a variable that is A plus B. How do you think you'd do that? So a new variable called C. So your new variable C and you want it to be, there you go, exactly. So now go ahead and run it. And now if you type C Oops. in the bottom corner, yeah. there you go. Okay. Uh -huh. So one of the things that's very confusing when they first start taking these tutorials online is the difference between when you've saved a variable, which is what you did with A, B, and C, versus when you've just run something on the console where you did A plus B, but it didn't get saved as anything. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's just something to remember. If you type it in the bottom, some people will do their coding in the bottom. I almost consider that misconduct because you can never remember what you did. I'm sorry. I don't have the memory to know what I did. So I always write it in the script and then run it because then I've got a record of exactly what I did. I'm going to show you a few more things. So let's say this was a program we cared about. We don't, but we'll do it anyway. Um, right now it is named Untitled 1. Do you see that? Uh, yes. Uh, upper corner under file. It's named Untitled right under file. So scroll down from file. It's under, you see that? And yeah. it's red. So it's always red when you've not saved it. Mm -hmm. So if you go and file save, there you go, and you give it a name. Okay, and hit save. Okay, so now a couple things have happened. One, where it said untitled that was read, it now says tutorialmamas.r. Perfect. Also, in your folder, which is your right hand side in the bottom, it is now a new file there. So you could actually mm. click on that. If you were doing something else, you close that or whatever, you could click on that and it would reopen up this file. <laughs> okay, so variables are really nice for numbers, but they're not just for numbers. They can be words as well. So let's make a word. Um, and actually I'm gonna make you, uh, something really fun. So when you do a word, to save a word, um, you need to put quote marks around it. Otherwise it doesn't know what you're trying to do. So let's make um, D equal to, and we're gonna put quote marks. And then oddly your cursor ends up in the middle because it knows you wanna build a variable. Um, just type happy birthday to you. All is one big phrase. With spacing or without? With spaces. So spaces are allowed if you're inside quotes. If you're not inside quotes, spaces are never allowed. So go ahead and run that. Okay, and now D, you can see it's over there, it's stored. And again, you'll notice quote marks around it, right? So this is where we first come to that sheet, that you sheet. You really replace that lift at the bottom with the four seat. So that cheat sheet you had, um, there's a section in, do you have it open right now? By, yep, you do, right there on the top. Go ahead and go to the cheat sheet real quick. Um, and if you scroll, down, I think it's the second page at the very top. Yep, right there. There's something called types. And they they don't introduce types until a little later, but I like to introduce types right away. It's this it, top corner. Is it blurry for you? Or That's is it strange? Can you try reloading the PDF and see what happens? Okay. I'm not sure why it's blurry. There you go. Oh, yeah. Okay. So in a computer when you store things it is very memory efficient to store numbers like computers are great at storing numbers but it takes much more space to store letters and so something that's happening under the hood that you don't really need to know but it's nice because then you can look at it and see how you tell a number which is the second thing in that list as numeric from a character, and you'll notice that a character has quotes around it. You see that? Mm -hmm. So there's 
those are the two that we're going to work with right away. We will get to the logical and the factor a little bit later, but always remember that you're in general either dealing with a numeric or a character. Sometimes those numerics and characters are also called integers or floats, which you can see over on the right hand side of the sheet sheet. Um, and sometimes characters are also known as strings. So right, right. Can you see where my cursor is? Maybe not. Let me see if I can annotate real quick. I'll go ahead and scroll back up to where the types are right uh, there. So this is their other names. And I only point out their other names because if you're reading a textbook or looking at something like Data Carpenter, they might not call it a numeric. They might call it an integer or a float. Um, mm -hmm. And an integer is any number. A float is any number with a decimal. And then they might call it a character, but they might also call it a string, um, which is why I'm just warning you guys ahead of time that those those language are used interchangeably and yet not everybody realizes they're not telling the audience those are interchangeable words. Okay, so go ahead and go back to um, the our studio now. Okay, so the cool thing is we've typed happy birthday to you. So we can use this, the first function we're going to use, and it's the most simple function there ever is. It's called rep, R-E-P. And so you type it, go ahead and type it in line five up above. Okay, R-E-P. And the nice thing is R is super good at telling you how to use a function. So you'll notice it popped up this little box and it says that we're going to repl replicate whatever you put in here. So you don't want rep length, you want rep, yep. We're going to replicate whatever you put in here. And so go ahead and just put D in there for now. Okay, go ahead and run that. So what it does is puts D in there one time. Go ahead and can you open a new tab? I know you said you had a ton, but we're going to open a new one and we're going to Google RStudio and rep because I want to show you what I do when I'm trying to learn a function. RStudio and rep, R-E-P, enter. And so what it'll do is it will take you to the site called R Documentation. You can click on that. And it tells you what is rep and how do you use it. So the top is always a description. You don't generally have to read it. Most of the time, the usage is the most useful part. And what you can see there is rep requires an X, which is the thing you just put in, anything you want. And then if you put something behind it, you need to tell it the number of times it should repeat that. Okay, mm -hmm. so go, let, go ahead and go back. Now that you know that's how it runs, let's say I wanna say happy to birthday to you twice. How do you think you'd do that? Rep. Uh -huh. D. That's what you want. And then and two times. Yes, but it wants a comma between each thing you do. Yep, there you go. And hit enter. There you go. Oh, nice. <laughs> so you have now built part of the happy birthday to you song. Um, <laughs> the place you will find this most useful is if you are building certain data things and you know, say in my instance, you know, sometimes I use like a, a drug treatment on cells. So I'll need to have five controls and five drug, right? And so the easiest way to do that is this rep function um, so that it will squish it all together for me so that they're already repeated for me so that I don't have to do it each time. Okay. I have a big question. Yes, go ahead. So why did we not uh, do rep D comma two? Uh, in tutorials underscore mamas data uh, way you defined a b c and d uh, i thought that is the place where we code yes yes so, so, why, so why why are we i'm sorry yeah why are we uh, okay Okay. So it works so, in either place, but if you're doing, I mean, if you're playing with data for one at home, do it in either, who cares? If you're gonna do it for something, cause most of you are grad students or PhDs or postdocs or faculty, um, you wanna do it in the upper corner. And the reason is you want to be able to save what you did so that you can do it again later, right? So we could put the sure. rep D2 up in the top and then we could hit save and then we could close that and open again. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, thank you. 
So it's just for memory's sake, because I can't remember what I did. I always, I don't hardly ever put it in the bottom corner unless I'm just looking at something. If I just want to look at what is A, which makes a little, it's a little silly right now because you can see it in the environment. But, you know, I get to the place where I have 500 things to find <laughs> and then it's a little hard. So I just type it in the corner to look at it. I pretty much only use my console to look. Okay. So um, let's say, you know, happy birthday to you is really useful, but the, the next line after happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you is happy birthday, dear, and then the name fills in, right? And so that's going to change every time that I sing the song. And that's where computers are really useful, no matter what you're doing, something that's going to change, they're good at. So let's give a uh, happy birthday to who's, whose birthday is closest? Anybody have a birthday today? <laughs> Mine's the 11th. Okay, Kelsey, we're going to do you. We're going to do happy birthday to Kelsey. Okay, so let's make a new variable E and E is equal to Kelsey. And it's up in the corners. It's quote marks, remember? Yep, there we go. Kelsey, okay, we're going to run that. Okay, and then we're going to need the other half of that sentence. So make f equal to happy birthday dear and make sure to put a space after it but we i'll show you maybe you need that maybe you don't depending on what you do so go ahead and run that okay so the night the thing we really want at this point is we want to combine multiple things and so what we're going to learn is a new function called paste it's one of my favorites um so let's just type the word song S-O-N-G, we're going to set song to something and do, go ahead and do it in the top script. So the song is going to be equal to, and the function I like so much is called paste, P-A-S-T-E, okay? And paste, you can think of as concatenate in Excel, if you've ever seen concatenate, it just squishes things together. So go ahead and start the parentheses. All functions will have a function with curly parentheses. That's how you know it's a function. Um, and what we're gonna paste together is all the parts we need to sing this song, right? So the first part of it is D, right? Happy birthday to you. So to put a D and then put a comma. And then we want another happy birthday to you, so another D. So the two was only for if we were running rep, because that was times. Paste mm -hmm. is just gonna squish it together as we tell it. So we're gonna tell it happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you comma f because that's happy birthday dear comma e there you go and then one more happy birthday you got it so go ahead and run song now remember song is stored in memory but we don't see it so if you type it right. in the bottom corner you'll see it oh you, you just made happy <laughs> birthday to you <laughs> wow <laughs> So the nice thing is, let's say we're going to change it to Rebecca's birthday. We can make song two. So if you copy that whole line above, just like you control C or however you normally copy. Yeah. You can make song number two. Right. And instead, you know, before we had Kelsey. So now let's let's make a new variable. I don't like to overwrite old ones because then I don't know what the old one was. So you can make a new variable, I don't know, R for Rebecca, right? And so R equals Rebecca. Okay, run this, you get an error, why not? So again, we're doing this on purpose because I want you guys to see the errors. Anybody is it, know? Is it because we didn't put G, like the sequence? No, nope, A particular G. sequence? Uh, it has to be within- The uh, comma. The comma. Then the what did- The quotes. Oh. That's right. Oh. Remember, all characters have to be quotes, but I'm glad you did this because you're going to do this constantly and you're going to be like, what the heck? Why isn't this working? It's got to be in quotes. The only thing that's allowed to not be in quotes is a number. So yeah, you can delete that line. Oh yeah. Does, does that make okay. sense? Oh, okay. 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 I got it. Ah. Okay. Right. Okay. So now we can copy song and make song number two. And instead we just need to change Kelsey, yep, that's right. And go ahead and run that one. And now you type song two and there it shows up. So, nice. so the whole reason this is very useful 
is because of the fact that you can flip things out like that, right? You can do these type of, you could type happy birthday to you in Word. That's obvious. But the ability to easily flip in and out pieces is where real R really shines because you can do that so quickly. Okay, we're going to do the fun one now. We're going to learn a for loop. These ones, I will warn you, it was the hardest thing for me to learn when I first started, okay? So the first thing we're going to need to do is right now we have really only defined variables that are one thing. But it's much more useful to define variables that are multiple things, okay? So we're going to make a new variable called names. You can just type names equals, oh, we can't name it names. So what you'll, reason is I, we can't name it names is did you notice that pop-up box? Yeah. Names is a function. How about yeah. our, our names? I bet our names is not a, a thing. We can name it our names. There you go. Our names equals, and we're going to learn a new um type of thing in r which is called a vector i like calling them lists more because i come from python and a list makes more sense if you want multiple things together in a group but to keep them separate but in like a line sort of like you have kids line up at a door you use something called a vector now a vector always starts with a c and then a parentheses so type the letter c and then parentheses perfect and now you can put E comma R. Okay. okay. So this is a list of two names. And if you run it, it will keep them separate. And you can type our names and see what it looks like. Because it doesn't necessarily look like what you're expecting. Go ahead and hit it. It's nothing. It should show up in a second. Oh, weird. Should just show up. Mm, let's try again. Did I run it? Yes. Very strange. I don't know why it's having trouble. Oh, oh there it went. It just took it a second. It was thinking. Probably there's a lot that's on there right now. Okay, so so right now the list of our names is only two names. Let's make it three names, okay? So put a comma behind R. And in that right behind R in our names at 11, yep, put a comma right behind the R. Another one? Uh, yep, behind the R or between it, that's fine too. Go between those two commas. And I'll tell you, you want to add your name, but remember when we tried to add Rebecca, we had to do something special to make it work. There you go. Perfect. Okay. Good. Now you can run that again and it's got all of your names in it. Oh. Our names. Yep. Oh, okay. Look at that. Okay. okay. Yeah. So that is a vector. A vector can contain anything you want, letters, numbers, words, anything. It just keeps it as a list in its history. Okay. And so you can ask for anything that is in that vector back out of that vector. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to type our names. Uh, in the console? Yep, the console's fine because we're just looking now. We're not setting anything. Okay. Right? Our names, square bracket, because that's the ask for is almost always a square, and the give is always, almost always um, the circular type parentheses. And go ahead and type a one in there. Okay. So what you're saying is I want the first thing in our names. Go ahead and enter. Oh. Okay. So how do you think you would get your name back out then, since you know the first name has a one right there? So I have to, I think, put my name because it doesn't have a code. Or uh, Oh, you didn't put your name in there? I thought you did. You did. It's in there. It's number two. Uh, I didn't. So if I put number two, I didn't define my name as number two. No. Or is it fine? It's just the order? The, the square sequence? bracket is just in order what is uh, okay. this value. Okay. Yep. So square bracket means three, ah. so that's this one. Okay. And then so obviously if you type in three. Perfect. Okay. okay. Now go ahead and push up. Just push uh. the up key on your keyboard. And I will teach you this uh. other great thing. Oh, okay. do you know what it did? Push up again. Oh. Ah. What it's is got going the on? history of everything you've ever typed. 
Oh. So if you know that what you typed this time is close to what you want to type next time, like you're just changing one, two, or three, then using the up and down arrow keys will give you whatever was just done. Go ahead, tell, ask your question. Uh, yeah, so uh, is it always free for mentioning a list? Uh, or like... So will the... any... Go ahead, go ahead, keep asking. Yeah. Yeah, so will the R get confused with, because we already defined C equal to A plus B. So does it not get confused between the C or like, is it just for a list I have to come up with a letter called C? How does it work? Ah, that's a good question. Very good point. So um, the C, when right before a parenthesis, uh, always means it is a list and that the computer just knows that means this is a list. You can't type, for instance, if you type A and then parentheses, it won't know what to do, right? Because parentheses mm -hmm. only are there for lists or functions. That's it. Does that make sense? Okay. So parentheses yeah. means yeah. list or function. So by adding the parentheses, you're forcing it to do this. Um, we're going to okay. do one other error on purpose because, again, you're going to run into this at some point. So go up above where it's line 12 and type your names. Yep, we'll set it equal to a C, a parenthesis, and, and then delete the um, second parenthesis. I wanna show you what it looks like. You won't normally do this. Okay, and then hit enter. Okay, so that's different than what I was going to have you do, but we'll do that error first. <laughs> okay, so what the error I was going to show you is up above, which is that X symbol. Whenever you see that X symbol beside the number, it means there's something wrong with this line. And generally, if you put your mouse over top of the X, it will tell you what's wrong. And it says, you've got the beginning bracket, but you don't have an end bracket. This is not allowed. Now, the problem is when you read that error, that's not like interpretable unexpected end of document unmatched opening bracket it kind of is if you've seen the error but if you haven't it isn't um so two things are happening down below in the console it's still waiting for a second close bracket okay and you have not given to it so if you hit enter there it's going to give you a plus sign and you'll notice before it was always a little arrow not a plus sign mm -hmm. the plus sign means i'm still expecting something from you and you're like i don't freaking know what it is <laughs> it's almost always a closed parenthesis or a quote mark that it's expecting so generally what i do is just throw a closed parenthesis and a quote mark in there try the closed parenthesis first and that will obviously down at the bottom so it won't let you run another line until you finish what you were doing below ah so what it did was it appended what you ran up above to the thing above and it didn't have the end of the parentheses does that make sense so that's why you're getting the error because it literally will keep asking you for input until it gets something that it considers good enough once it goes back to the little arrow symbol, then you're ready to keep going on the console. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You can do it again in the console. If you type a, I'll show you the error again. In the console, type a, an open quote mark. Yeah. Uh, Your names equals C and open parentheses and quote mark. And then just use one quote mark, get rid of one of the two, and it will error again. Oh, it won't let you get rid of it. It didn't let you get rid of one. No. <laughs> it was like, no, 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 you're not allowed to do that. <laughs> the point is, if you have one quote mark or one parenthesis, it will error on you. And generally, it will error in a way that it gives you that plus sign. And if it gives you that plus sign, you have to guess or try and figure out what you did wrong to close it and in this case you actually have two errors you don't know it but you do so in this case you've opened a parenthesis and you've opened a quote mark okay mm -hmm. and the part that's a little confusing is because they want you to be able to put parentheses in closed mark or quote marks 
you have to first close the quote mark. So go ahead and do a quote. In the console or the or, or the Either one's fine. Console's probably easier at this point because we're in the middle of an error. Okay. So quote mark so there. I fixed the already broken one. Yep. So I would fix the quote mark first by adding another quote mark. Okay. In the bottom console, a little quote. Her name. Oh, nope. You have to actually just do the quote. Uh, so it's not letting me do it. Uh, okay. Okay. Hello? So you've given it two quote marks now. You need to give it one. Okay. There you go. Enter. And that will fix it. Okay. Now, what's really funny is type your names to see what it looks like. <laughs> Does anybody know why it looks like that? Somebody want to guess? So this is one of those things that's terrible when you first start because it makes no sense as to why it would show you that. Okay. So what the computer is doing is if you look three lines up where you very first typed your names with one quote, okay? It went, okay, this is a list. I can tell it's got a C there and it's got a parenthesis. I'm going to start with the first thing in the list, which will start with this quote mark. Maybe I'll annotate to make this easier. Okay, so here's my beginning of my list. Got it. I'm starting a list. Now I'm going to begin the first thing in my list and it's going to start here. And the thing is, you didn't give it the second quote. So it says it starts here and then this is all part of the first name in the list. Oh, and then I hit a quit mark, quote mark. So now that's the end of the first thing in the list. So it thinks you wanted all of that pink stuff as the first thing in the list. Does that make sense? It's a little hard when you first start. It's okay. <laughs> it took you completely literally. Go ahead and push up and hit enter again. Uh, sorry, two times. Push up two times. Oh, it's going to make us do it again. Quote mark, just the quote mark at this point. It'll make it easier. Just one quote mark. Hold on. Uh, will it let you? Yes. And then parenthesis. Oh. One parenthesis. Okay, okay. And I'll show you why in a minute. It will make more sense. Oh, you added a second quote mark. So now you got to do another quote mark and another parenthesis to get it out. Another quote mark. And a parenthesis. Okay, hit enter. enter. Yep. Okay. Here, I got to clear my stuff out of your way so you can see. So this time it said, I can't figure out what you're doing because you put two quote marks right next to each other with no comma in between. So, mm. so the point is it takes you literally and you put a parenthesis between the two quote marks. So it thought the name you were giving it is just that parenthesis, which is not what you were trying to do, but that happens a ton in R. You'll do something and it will not be what you think you told it to do, which is why every time I set a variable, I check it because I don't trust that the computer got the variable right. Does that make sense? And you check it by just typing it in the console and That's pressing right. enter it, like That's running right. it to make sure it's... It's really what I think it is. That's right. Okay. Okay. Go ahead and, re go ahead and uh, ask the question. Someone has a question. Um, hi, um, so setting a variable in the console versus in the window, in the upper window, yep. what is the difference? Um, and I have another question. Um, if I have, if I write a line in that upper window, I don't know what it's called, uh, and then I don't run it, what happens to that line and how do I know that I didn't run it? Thank That's you. Good. That's very good. Okay, so the first one is the top is only to save what you did. So that's the only difference between the bottom and the top. Doing it in the bottom, you have no record other than your push up thing. Once it closes, it's all gone, right? But the upper corner, it if you save it and you close this and you reopen it up, it will all be there, okay? 
let's does let's it automatically do save let's go ahead and do that yeah so do file save real quick to make sure everything's saved yep file save oh, oh. it doesn't need to it's already been saved mm -hmm. good so it's automatically saving for you. So let's go ahead and do it. Up in the upper right-hand corner where your name is, click on it and tell it you want to log out. Ah. Right there in that upper corner. Yep, log out. I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so go ahead and log back in by clicking log in, which was right next to your, where your name was. Yep, continue. And hopefully it doesn't show your password. It doesn't, good. <laughs> <laughs> that's smart <laughs> okay so the thing is your project is still there right there it's called untitled project and if you click on it and go back in okay so in this case it did save your environment um it does not need to do that go ahead and um let's see close this which it's sorry, not close this. Uh, I'm going to circle the X I want you to close right here. That X. So that closes the script, and the script is near gone, now gone. And then I want you to click on this thing right here, which is a tiny broom. Oh. Uh, oops, sorry. You're supposed to be on. Can you click right here? Yep, yeah, perfect. And then yeah. click the tiny broom. Yes, I really do want to clear it. So it no longer remembers anything you did, okay? And that will often happen on your own computer when you close down R. Clearly it didn't this time. So now if you go to that console and type A, go to the console, yep, type A, it's gonna once again say, I don't know what A is, mm -hmm. because it can't remember what you did. Now go ahead and hit file up in the top. Yeah, that's right, you were gonna do it there. That's a fine way to do it too. Either way, you're opening the tool, the R script. And now highlight all that stuff up above. Yep, and hit run. And now type A. See, so the nice thing about the upper corner is that you're saving it so that at a later day and time, you can come back, highlight all of it and hit run and it will do it again. Does that make more sense now? Uh, so run is an activating function. It's not something that's already activated every time I'm using this exactly. list. And so that also answers your other question. If you never hit run, it's not in R. R doesn't know it. It's yes in the script, but it does not exist in the environment and A has no meaning. Mm. Whereas once you hit run, that's when A has meaning. Not until you hit run. I can type whatever I want there. And it will have no meaning until I hit run on that line. That make more sense? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So now the whole reason we did our names. Okay, are you ready? Now we're going to type. Um, <clears throat> we're going to make our own function. So, so far we have used two functions. Paste was one of them and rep was another. We're gonna make our own function this time, okay? Um, actually, maybe we'll just do it as a for loop. Okay, so we're gonna do it as a for loop. So you're gonna say for, F-O-R, uh, no, F-O-R, yep, there you go, space, and then parentheses again. And these parentheses are for part of a function in which we're gonna tell it we want to use each of the names for happy birthday. So what we have to do is for name, in names. So go ahead and type name, name. Oh, no, you don't want quotes this time. And again, this is one of those things that's really hard when you first start. Quotes are for if you're building a variable, but if you're making a new variable, which is what you're doing here, you don't put quotes. Oh, we can't name it names again. Okay, how about just for N? We'll call it N instead. For N space, um, Parent or sorry, um, percent. That's the word I'm looking for. Percent sign. You know the percent sign. Yep, in. I n percent sign. So the, the two percent signs on either side make that into a special function as well. Space. So you have to tell it n in what, and we're gonna say our names. 
<clears throat> okay. And so this is a for loop. It has two sections. The first section is saying, what do I want to loop over? Which we're going to loop over the things in our names. And then the second section is, what do you want me to do with it? So go behind that, that uh, parenthesis, all the way to the end. Yep. And then where do I describe it? It's the strange bracket right next to P if you hold shift. Hold shift. Yeah, there you go. That bracket. They're called curly brackets, okay? And so a for loop always has something you're going to loop over and a section of it that it's going to do something. Go ahead and go to your R cheat sheet so we can look at it real quick, which is the middle cheat sheet you had up above, remember? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Go to the R cheat sheet. Okay, so for loops, I think we're on the first page. Yep, there you go. For loop programming. Okay, this is one of the most basic components of, of programming. Um, and it's where you want to do things over and over again, changing one thing, which in this case, we're going to sing happy birthday over and over again to each person separately. Okay, so the for loop in the corner says for variable in sequence, which is what you just did. And actually, it doesn't have parentheses, so we are the percent signs, so we may want to get rid of those percent signs. I always use them, but I, I don't think you have to have them. So go ahead and get rid of them because it's less more less confusing. And then it said, what's in the middle? What's after that? If you go back to the cheat sheet, we did the first part, which is for such for variable in sequence. The second part is do something. So let's make it the easiest thing we can do, which is called printing. So go ahead and go back to your, your code. Yep. And you say print. Print is another function. Put parentheses. And what you put inside is what you want it to print. And so N is the new thing we're building. Okay, so go ahead and just type N and run it. And then we'll talk about what it's doing. Okay, go ahead and run. So what did it do when you said for N in our names? No? For N. Yes. Hmm. Basically, it's breaking our names up into this chunk where it's going to do the first thing and then the second thing and then the third thing. And so what we told it to do was just tell us each name. Not all that helpful, honestly, to tell you each name, right? What is helpful, though, is to paste your song in there. Okay, so copy your song up on line eight. Okay, and put it right after the first curly bracket. Right before print. Yeah. Hit enter there and hit enter there. Perfect. Go ahead and hit enter. I don't, okay. we don't want to run it yet. We want to hit enter. We've got to separate the two commands. So you've actually got two commands now. The first one is to build a song, and the second one is to print n. So go ahead. This is another, this is not how you'd normally do it. I'm going to do it this way on purpose because I make this mistake all the time. Go ahead and hit run. And it will look like nothing has changed. And the reason it does that is you set song, but you never told it to tell you song. So the function to tell me song is that print function. So instead of printing N, print song. Okay, go ahead and run that. So this is a little weird thing about loops. You have to put it on the first line when you run it, not on the second line. So go to where the four is when you run this line rather than line 13 rather than line 14. Yeah, for some reason you can't put it in the second one. So what should I do? You can run line 13 and 14, or you can just run line four, 13, oh. which will automatically run. Four. Oh, okay. Okay, so what it's doing is for every name inside of our names, it's gonna print the song. But it's printing the song the way you originally made it, which is D-D-F-E-D, -E right? So if you change that E, in song to an N, what do you think is going to happen? Um, and if you don't know, go ahead and try it. See what happens. Every name, maybe. That's right. Exactly. So each time it runs through, it oh, will yeah. choose a different name. Oh, okay. so now you can see how this can explode very quickly. <laughs> 
Oh, wow. Okay, so we, yeah, go ahead, talk, go ahead and talk, ask the question. Uh, yeah, so we did not initialize N anywhere, so does oh, our- you, you did, understand you don't realize it. So you initialized N right there, you're right, exactly. Okay. You set N in the loop. N is a variable that changes each time you go through. Does that make sense? Yes. So, so another way N every time. Sorry, go ahead. Should it be N every time or like can I use any variable? You could use uh, any variable. variable you want there. So that is up to you. You just have to change it in both places. So let's change it to something other than N and you have to change it in both places on line 13. Um, go okay. call it call it n2 on line 13 call it n2 but you'll have to call it n2 there which is where you're setting it you're n2. setting the variable there yep and then um, you're using the variable in the song paste section does that make sense set yeah. it in the first part use it in the second and go ahead and run it again um but there's two n's now here like n is rebecca and r is rebecca oh yes so this has to do with the way the computer stores it okay mm -hmm. what it's really doing is it's taking this position in the computer and saying every time i call this position go over here and get whatever's stored here okay so we have stored both n and r as Rebecca and it will go if you in the bottom type N or R or N2 it will now go to Rebecca oh because all of those now oh, Rebecca. Go to Rebecca yes okay now did it make sense when uh, I'm not sure how to say your name Fav Favithra how do you say that <laughs> yeah it... you can just call me Pavi the first four letters yeah okay. it makes much sense now thank you Yes. So you set it, you just, it's not setting it the same way with an equal sign. Instead, it's setting it as a variable in a for loop. Um, and every time you loop, and at the end of the loop, this is the other weird thing, right? At the end of the loop, it stays whatever the last thing in the list was. And that's why it's N and N2 are still Rebecca, because it's going to stay whatever is last. So if we go up above to our names, after that R, put a comma, and add somebody else's name, doesn't matter who, you can use one of your mm -hmm. kids. A new put name? Marks, yep, put quote marks and then a new name. There you go, go ahead and run it. Okay, and now run the 13 and 14 again. Mm. And so and now you look it up yeah. there, and because Jack was the last thing. Now, remember, we set it to N2 this time. We never set it to N. So N is staying as Rebecca. Whatever the last thing you set something as is what it is. For instance, on line 15, if you set A equal to seven, it overwrites whatever the, la the last thing wins in every case. <laughs> oh, so it will never be five again. Yeah, so that's going to be one of your biggest problems is you'll think you said something and it will have gotten overwritten somewhere else because you'll have two places in the script assigned A to something. So you got to be really careful to watch that everything is what you think it is and that you have not multiple times created a variable with the same name. That makes sense? Yes. Okay, so you will probably never type out your own vectors. That's the dirty little secret. Okay. <laughs> so because you know, how often do we type out our own data? That doesn't happen. We get it from some file. And so that's what I'm gonna have you guys do right now. I'm gonna drop into the chat a file. And everybody who um, is still working along you are going to just paste this line oh without the squiggly in front i don't know why the squiggly's there just start at d for download there you go that's right okay so just copy that line onto your um r studio and run it 
And what we're doing here is downloading a file from someone else, okay? So now in your bottom right hand corner, you will see that you have a new file called states. Okay, mm -hmm. it's about the simplest file you can do. You can look at, you can view the data and it will show you what it looks like, okay? And what it looks like is a two column table. Um, it's a CSV, which always just means there's a comma between each column. And right now you don't have this data in your console. So what we're going to have to do is pull it into your console, which is going to be most of what you're doing. You're not typing things very often. You're pulling in data. So go back to the tutorial mamas. And we're going to learn how to pull in data from a file. Okay. So when you pull in data from a file, most often it's what's called a data frame. And a data frame is like you'd have an Excel. Does that make, you've seen those. So let's call it a variable called DF. And you'll see that very, very common. People often name data frames DF as their variable name. We're gonna set it equal to, and we're gonna have to use a new function and it's called read CSV. So R-E-A-D dot, and look, it even pops up for you, CSV. I wanna read a CSV. Okay, and the name of it is states. However, if you just say states, it thinks you're looking for a variable so you got to put the quotes around it because you're looking for a file name, not a variable. So the quotes thing takes a while to get used to. When do I need it? When do I don't? Go ahead and hit tab. Just inside it right after the S to see if it'll finish it for you. Yep, it will. So oftentimes when you're in the middle of typing, you can hit tab and it will guess what you want. And here it guessed that what you wanted was this states file because you typed the first three letters. And it went, oh, oh, the only thing I have here with those first three letters is states. Okay, so the tab is most often your guess what it's going to be. Go ahead and run that. And then type DF in the bottom console. There you go. You have pulled in your first data frame. Okay, so now um, the nice thing about data frames is that you can do all sorts of things with them that are quick and easy. So uh, the first thing you almost always do is to summarize them. So if you go back to your cheat sheet, I wanna show you on the cheat sheet so you can do this without me, uh, the PDF, yep. There will be, um, go ahead and scroll down. And what we just did, by the way, right there, do you see it um, on the, your mouse is right above it to the left. DF read tables for a dot text. And the one you did was DF read dot CSV. You did that. And now that you've read it, you really need to take a quick look at what it is. And the easiest way to do that, I think they have it down here, scroll to the next page, is summary. I think they have summary. Yep, data frames. There you go. So data frames is a heading right down there. And it shows you how to do different things with the data frames, okay? So the things you can do, let's do list subsetting first, which is, do you see this DF dollar sign X? So you've got an imaginary data frame. It has two columns and their names are X and Y. And so if you type DF dollar sign X, that's the column's name. So it will just show you that column. So go ahead and go back to your POSIX, your, your RStudio and type DF. And then we need one of the column names. So hit dollar sign and it actually fills out the two column names for you. It's like, which column do you wanna look at? And you click one. I wanna look at this column and run it then it just gives you the information in that column. Okay. So is DF a keyword? Um, so, in now, line, so now DF is a variable. Yep. Oh, DF, okay. so all variables can be all sorts of things. They can be strings, they can be numbers. Strings, remember, is the same as a, a character. Character or string are interchangeable. They have quote marks around them. Um, a number, or it can be an entire data set full of data, okay? In line 17, can I have like DF2 or something like that? I can, I can make DF2. Should we make a DF2? Ooh, let's, let's do this. We'll make a DF2. Yeah, let me give you one more file to download real quick. It was pretty easy to do that download. We'll do the other download. Is this other download, this one's way bigger. Okay, so let me pop it into chat real quick. 
is I gave you a tiny file, which is just states. This other download, oh, again, don't use the little yeah. in the front. I don't know why it's pasting that. Okay. So when you did it, you got a new file called Classic Rock Songs. Okay. So now, how do you think you'd open that as DF2? So, DF2. Yeah. That's two, right. That's right. Um, dollars equals reads. Yep, that's right. Dot yes, fee. That's right. Um, classic. And remember, tab is your favorite thing to do. Oh, okay. Uh, I love tab. <laughs> I love tabs too. I, I'm really bad at spelling, so tab saves my butt a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now DF2, what column names do we have? If you do DF2 dollar sign, it'll tell you all your col column names. Oh. You can pick any column to look at. There you go. Now, the problem with data frames is they're often very big. So the first thing you're going to want to know when you get a data frame is how big is it? And the the function for that is DIM for dimension. Yep, put parentheses and then put your DF2 in there. Okay, and it's gonna tell you the dimensions of DF2 when you run it. And it says that there are 2,229 rows and eight columns. <laughs> oh. Which is often how big it is. The other thing you can do is they have what's called, two functions called n row and n call so if you type n row all one word n row means n rows you put a parentheses and call it on df2 call it what uh, call it on df2 so this is a function we're going to apply the function to df2 nope just run it on df2 like you did dimension yep there you go enter there you go that's how many rows you have so when you first pull it in, a lot of what you're doing is looking at it, like how big is it? How many columns do I have? What are the names of the columns? All that type of stuff. The easiest, quickest way to do that is a function called summary. It is also on that sheet. But if you type summary and then put the DF2 in there, it'll tell you what the columns are and what's inside of them. Oh. And for number columns, it gives you minimums and maximums. For letter columns, it gives you, these are characters, and there's this many of them, that type of stuff. The other one that's super important in all the data sets you're going to get, because they're likely not very tiny, is to type head, H-E-A-D, and put the data frame inside of those parentheses. Yep. Because what that gives you is just the first six lines which is generally almost always how I look at a data frame because I'm like, oh, that's what the columns are, right? Because it's easy to guess what they're doing when you have the first six lines. Okay, we are actually out of time. Um, are there any other errors I want to make sure to show you guys? Maybe. Well, I won't. Yeah, I think you'll find it. The major one I was going to show you, do you see how we read CSV up there in data frame two? Can you change this read CSV to the read table? So uh, line 20, change it to read table. And then go ahead and run it again. Read dot table. Yep. So this is an error you're going to see a lot. And the error is basically saying, um, I looked for the separator, which in read.table, it expects tabs to separate everything. And in read.csv, CSV, it expects commas to separate everything, right? So what the error is saying is, I looked for the separator, but I couldn't find the separator. What's wrong? Okay. And so generally, it just means that you picked dot .table when you needed dot .csv or vice versa. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So um, the last thing I will say is that um, you probably want to output whatever you do later on. And so go ahead, just, just go back to the um, R cheat sheet. 
and we won't do it because you know we haven't changed anything but if you did change anything go scroll back up to where we did data frame dot read yep right there so you have your read on the left read csv um data frame dot read csv and then mm -hmm. you have writing on the other side so if you change anything to save it it's called writing in code rather than save and generally you should not save it as the same name. Like if you change anything in your code, you should have your original file and then you should have an edited file saved with a different name. Does that make sense? So that's like in and out. <laughs> that's what you need to know. Um, the last thing I will say before we go, if you go back, if this is gonna kill you, so I'm make sure everybody sees this error. This is the last one we'll do. Okay, so type, in the bottom corner, we'll just do it in the console, type min, which means minimum, on parenthesis, df, or actually df2, you're right, it's df2, dollar sign, and then we need to pick one of the number years, not year yet, we'll do year in a minute, or not release year, uh, play count, play count sounds great, that's a number, go ahead and hit enter. Okay, so the minimum play count was zero. Let's do the max, M-A-X. Dollar sign play count. There you go. Okay, so the maximum play count was 124 or 42. The minimum was zero. So that's what should happen when you run it on a number. Now do the same thing on release year. Is I want to show you this error because it's going to mess everybody up at some point. So dollar sign release year. No, not year, release year. I don't actually know what the year column is, but it's not a year, which is really weird. Release dollar sign release year. It's like the oh. third one. Yep, there you go. Hit enter. So it says the minimum release year is quote marks. And you're like, what? Okay, so go ahead and do a head on DF2 again. Head parentheses DF2. Enter. Okay, so look at the year column, the release year column, which is right up above where it says like 1982 and 1981. And it totally looks normal, right? Um, mm -hmm. But it has some blanks. And what those blanks will look like, if it sees a blank, it's going to put it in there as two quotes with nothing in between. That's what a blank looks like to R. Okay. The other problem, and you won't see this until you look at this column. So let's look at the column. So down below type DF dollar sign year, or sorry, DF two dollar sign release year, two dollar sign release year. Okay. Enter. Now, what do you remember me telling you about numbers and quote marks? Are numbers supposed to be in quote marks? No. No, numbers are not supposed to be in quote marks. So what happened was when it read the table, it guesses as to whether the column has numbers or strings or characters, right? And it guessed wrong. And that's going to happen a crap ton of the time. <laughs> it guessed that these were words, not numbers. And so it can't do a minimum and a maximum on a word. And so it doesn't know what to do. And it just gives you quote marks. Same thing if you did max on this column, it would give you something random because it doesn't know how to read it as a number right now. It's reading it as a string or a character. Does that make sense? Yes. It thinks it's a word. It's not a word. So you're going to have to fix this at some point, and I'm going to show you how to fix it. Um, so go up above to line 23, and we'll type the fix in there. So DF2 dollar sign release. Release, uh, exactly, tab complete, exactly. Now you're going to make that equal to as, so as dot numeric, n-u, and you can tab. Yep, there you go. Okay, so you want it to be a numeric, but you got to tell it to what apply to. So you're going to apply that to DF2 dollar sign release year. DF2 dollar sign release year. Okay, so basically all it's doing is it's going to take the same data, but turn it into numbers. Go ahead and run it. Ah, so it 
Now this is different. It's red, so it looks like an error. But if it ever says warning message, it did it anyway. It's just letting you know something's funky, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's not the same as an error because it does it anyway, but it's saying there's something funky. What's it telling you that is funky? NA is introduced by coercion. Right, it didn't know what the blanks were, so it put NAs there. So go ahead and push up twice and you'll print um, dollar the, yeah, in the console push up twice where you did the, yep, right there, hit enter. So now they're all numbers, but wherever there was a blank, it filled in an NA. So missing data is the NA or the That's right. code Missing marks. data is always filled in as an NA in R. Mm -hmm. And most functions are screwed up by NAs. So the last thing we'll show you is how to fix a screw up because of NAs. You're all going to have them. So go ahead and type, go ahead and type the minimum. Uh, you can just push up again because we did this earlier. Remember minimum on the release year? Keep keep pushing till we go to the minimum on the release year. Go ahead. Yep. Hit again. This is it. Now, yep. So go ahead and run minimum. Minimum's one of the functions that hates NAs. It's going to give you NA every time if you've got an NA. Mm -hmm. Most functions are like that, but almost all of them push up, have this special, I think they call it a flag. Right after DF dollar sign year, put a comma and then put NA uh sorry little letter na which is confusing i know because big letters used in the thing dot rm which means na remove equals true um and it's going to want it all in caps but it'll tell you that <laughs> it's like no you need all caps yeah now you hit it there you go the minimum release year is 1071 for a rock song <laughs> So it's 1971, maybe. And That's better. probably right. Exactly. Yeah. So this would be almost all your data is going to come into R ugly and dirty. Um, I would, when you first start, you can clean it in R. I wouldn't recommend it. I actually recommend a tool called Open Refine. You just Google Open Refine real quick so that people can see what it looks like. Yeah. So if you have data where you're like, oh crap, something's wrong with this data, Open Refine is my favorite tool. It looks like Excel when you click into it. And you don't have to right now. I just want people to oh. see it um, because you have to sign up for an account and stuff. Um, it looks like Excel, but you can, when you save your file, you export it and it saves everything you did. Like if you found a typo and you changed it, now it will save the original file, the changed file, and all code to reproduce the changed file. So it's super good at cleaning up um, especially if you've ever got data where people typed names in it it's got this automatic function where you can say find names that are too similar and like it'll find two spellings of mary but the last name's the same and it'll say are these the same or different and you get to change it so anyway if you have dirty data use open refine and just find a youtube video on open refine um the maximum is more accurate so you can just push up and do max if you want and then we can be done for today yeah, no, go ahead and just put, yeah, just up one and then max it. There you go. Well, that was max play count. Just push up one on the minimum release year and change. Oh, here's another tip. You don't have to know this. Control A will get you to the front of that line. Okay. Or you can just go where min is and change min to max. Yep, change min to max. I want the maximum. Enter. There you go. The maximum year in the data frame is 2014. Okay, so those are the hangups you're going to have. Remembering types is super important. If you go back to the cheat sheet real quick, because at some point you will have a number when it expects a string or a string when it expects a number. Go ahead and scroll down to that type section, which was the top of the second page. Uh, yep, a little higher right there. So at some point we'll have a number when you expect a character or a character when you expect a number and that as numeric and as characters, how you flip them if they've got it wrong. Um, we didn't go over logicals and factors, but those are for later. And then the other errors you saw, it not knowing what the variable is probably means you didn't run it. Anything else that you guys um, want to ask before we leave? And feel free to uh, grab me for questions. There's also a, I'm on an R, 
what's it called? I'm on a Facebook group that's for people asking our questions. It's really useful because generally someone will hop on a second and just answer it for you. Um, I don't remember what it is off the top of my head, though. It's like our statistical questions or something, which is funny because most of the questions are not statistical. Our statistical software is what it's called in Facebook. If you want to join that group, they'll answer questions for you just like this one. Could you share it in the chat? Yeah, sure. Our statistical software. Um, the things we didn't get to today are like, we used all base R. And what I mean by base R is the stuff that comes automatically with R. Um, most things you're going to do are going to use packages. And in a package, someone else wrote a bunch of code. And when you hit library, it will run their code and then your code will run behind their code. The only thing to really think about there is if they set a variable, you can't, you shouldn't write over their variable name, <laughs> right? If they named something names, remember we tried to write over names, that's a bad thing to change a variable. Um, so when you're typing, if it starts popping up that yellow box, you can't use that variable name. You have to pick a different one. Okay. Thank you guys. I hope you had fun. Uh, if you like I said, if you have any questions, let me know. If you run into problems, we can run another one of these on further stuff. But the big one really is the errors are kind of annoying. They don't make much sense. And if you can ask somebody who's working on R before, generally they can tell you what the error means, even though they're not super readable. <laughs> and I hope you guys have fun. Thank you. Thank you so much. No problem. We'll Thank talk you. to you guys soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>